this evening we're going to once again just uh, paint a very broad brush. Uh, just we're going to cover a couple of topics: immigration during COVID, which is um, you know it's it's a it's a moving target over there with with the Trump regime. Um, so Leon will give us a bit of a, a brief update in terms of immigration during COVID. We're going to go around some non-immigrant visas. Um, we have a number of people that are, are looking at non-immigrant visas. And then we're going to really focus our attention on immigrant visas. Um, and naturally, by virtue of the business I'm involved in, we'll tend to focus a little bit on the EV5 investment visa, um, which I've been involved in for a number of years. And then we're going to try and make it as interactive as possible. So we have had a couple of questions that people have specifically asked us to address, which we'll do during the Q&A session. But as we're going through the slides, if there are any specific questions that people want answered at a specific point, just please go into the chat box um, and script it and uh, we'll try and make it interactive. All right, Rob, I think uh, three minutes past, I think we can, we can go. Okay. Hey. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's really nice to have everybody in line. Like I said, we had quite a, we've had quite a good turnout. Our numbers are still climbing. Um, a little bit of an introduction. I'm Stuart Ferguson from American Dream. I'm the CEO. Uh, myself and my business partner, Rob, uh, have been in the EB-5 investment visa uh, realm of immigration since 2007. And have to date processed well in advance of, uh, well, well in excess of about 300 investment visas into the U.S. Um, our success rate is 100%, so we've never ever had a failure. Certainly, if one's objective is to immigrate and settle down with the family in the least uh, intrusive and easiest mannerism, certainly the EB-5 investment visa is a, is a direct path to that. Um, we're very uh, privileged to have Leon Fassfeld from Fassfeld & Hugo. Uh, Leon is one of our panel immigration attorneys. We um, have worked with Leon quite a quite exceptionally um, over the last couple of years um, and certainly last year as we saw a major influx of those wanting to get into the United States our, our deal volume between us uh, was at an all-time high but Leon if you wouldn't mind just doing a bit of an introduction in terms of your firm and the services that you offer. Yeah good evening and good evening it's always like to Afrikaans to praat, but for purposes of this conversation and making sure Stuart can understand me, I will wow. stick to English. <laughs> um, my name is Leon Versfeld. I am a proud graduate of Turkey's and uh, me and my partner Etienne Yucho graduated from Turkey's before we respectively moved to the United States and Australia. At the time, he was far more busier than I was because uh, at the time everybody was moving to Perth and packing up for Perth. Things have quite dramatically changed over the years. Uh, when I came to the United States, my practice was not focusing on immigration. I did a variety of plaintiff's work and defense work. So I was a litigator. And uh, post 9-11, things have dramatically changed <clears throat> where the old INS changed to the Department of Homeland Security. So my practice gravitated towards immigration. It's been a very rewarding practice. Uh, that's something that we exclusively do. So Etty and I have joined forces to help people from around the world immigrate to the United States and Australia, respectively. Um, I have worked with uh, American Dream quite extensively as a, uh, you know surrounding the uh, the EB-5 program, is something that one of the options that we'll be talking about. Our offices are located in Kansas City. Oftentimes, people ask me, "Well, where's your office is located?" It's in Kansas City. They don't know where it is. Uh, you know, just to be quite honest, I didn't know where it was when I first came here, but it turned out to be a great city. This is where my wife is from, and this is where I ultimately ended up. I've been here for over 20 years now, uh, you know, so I've gotten used to the weather and stopped complaining about it, whether it gets cold or get, whether it gets hot. Uh, but things in Kansas City is, is great. Uh, the practice of immigration allows me to represent anybody anywhere. Um, 
you know, most cases uh, are uh, immigration is federally regulated. So whether or not you are filing your application as a South African living in Dallas or living in South Africa, we handle all of those applications as we file it in, in the United States. Um, so we'll, prob we'll be um, uh, working exclusively with, um, uh, with uh, folks here in the United States and filing your application here and assisting you uh, abroad once your visa is approved. Great, thanks very much, uh, Leon. Uh, I've been to Kansas City, I, I came to visit you. It's a really nice little city. Um, and then we're also joined by Chris Immelman from uh, Pam Goldin uh, International Property. Uh, Chris and I formed a association during the early part of last year, and certainly um, we've, we've gained a lot of traction. So Chris, welcome to uh, the webinar. Um, and maybe if you wouldn't mind just, I mean, Chris, Chris has been responsible for uh, creating uh, Pam Golding's uh, footprint into alternative residency programs. Uh, as you know, they were involved in Eden Island and Seychelles, Mauritius. Uh, he's been quite aggressively involved in the Portuguese Golden Visa program, and then, um, well, Portugal uh, Golden Visa program, and then uh, gravitated quite aggressively towards uh, promoting uh, the EB-5 into the US. So welcome, Chris, but if you, if you wouldn't mind saying some words, uh, Thank you, Stuart. Um, you can hear me all right? Yep, perfect. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Yeah. Um, um, nice to talk to you and, and see you again, Leon. Um, uh, always good. Um, yeah, um, our association with American Dream, as Stuart says, is uh, now um, almost almost two years old. Uh, we've done a lot of work with them. And um, when I initially was uh, doing work in other residencies and citizenship programs around the world, um, America never crossed you know, sort of my, 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 my desk at all. Until one day, Stuart picked up the phone and said, "Chris, uh, uh, I'm in Cape Town. Um, do you want to like? You, would you like to meet, get together, and have a coffee?" I said, "Sure." So we got together, and uh, I think at the end of the meeting, we shook hands and we said, "Listen, we'd like to do business together." I like the way that Stuart and his team uh, do business. They're extremely thorough. Uh, they're straight shooters. Um, I, I knew I knew from that very moment on that these are the guys I'll be working with and walking the walk uh, on the EB5 program. Um, um, after that meeting, we visited. I've been to, to, to the States now, I think, three times with, with uh, Stuart and his team, um, where we, where we, where we um, met the uh, local American partners, um, which I took a lot of comfort in because um, it's one thing doing the American um, visa program, and the EB5 is, a, is, a, is obviously the end goal for, for, for people entering the program. But for me, the underlying investment is also important. Uh, we entrust the Pam Golding name with. Uh, with uh, um, with um, spending a lot of money overseas and a lot of things that we do, people buying flats in, uh, in whether that's in the UK or probably in Portugal or Mauritius, as Stuart was saying earlier, we need to make sure that our due diligence stacks up. And accordingly, I go and visit um, every um, um, property that we promote together with uh, with American Dream and their and, and, and their guys to make sure that it's uh, that it's uh, the due diligence stacks up and that it's got credibility um, not only in the development that they are promoting, but also in the people behind it, the developers and the people that they're working with. So that ultimately, when uh, people do invest with them, um, their money stacks up um, and, and, and with the rest of the team, uh, Leon and his guys, um, the, the, of course, the visa stacks up. So i um, always delighted to be part of it. Um, uh, Stuart, thanks for inviting me and uh, you know, keen to listen to the rest of the show. Likewise, Chris, and I think maybe um, you know, if we can just we saw a dramatic change in uh, investor sentiment during the, during the course of last year. You know, a lot of people had looked at uh, immigration options into the U.S. as possibly a plan B, very similar to other alternative residency programs. But certainly, um, and you, you'll concur, I mean, during the, during the course of last year, we, without doubt, the majority of our inquiries and certainly inquiries that we're dealing with this year, it's very much that America is uh, very much something that um, is, is a debt is very much on their radar in terms of a plan A, uh, a full proper turnkey relocation and settlement uh, in the US. Yeah, Stuart, uh, definitely what we experience as well. Um, you know, people that, that you know, wanna, want to want to create a, a, a new future um, and, and somewhere else. Uh, America is a, is a, is a, a plan that's um, now accessible to South Africans that maybe wasn't so, so easy in the past. And, you know, it was a little difficult from our point of view. We didn't have the right people that we're working with. But, yeah, I, I would agree with you. You know, America has been in this nation for a lot of people, and we're seeing it more and more that uh, South Africans are coming forward and saying, well, 
you know, if I'm going to make the change, if I'm going to move on, this is where I want to go to. So uh, I concur with that for sure. Perfect. Uh, Leon, maybe let's just uh, start with uh, immigration during COVID. I mean, there have been some announce announcements by the Trump uh, uh, immigration that uh, all visa processing had been ceased. But uh, if you wouldn't mind just confirming that EB5 is exempt from that. And maybe just give us an update in terms of what the real impact on COVID and immigration is. Um, are consulate interviews taking place? The ramifications for people that have got... Uh, visas that are going to be expiring or people that are currently abroad where they may be on a different visa category. Um, if you wouldn't mind just talking around some of the implications in terms of immigration during, during this uh, unknown COVID uh, situation. Uh, unknown, I think, is kind of where the emphasis lies. And the agency, both the Department of State that deals with the consulates as well as the USCIS, the agency that is tasked with um, the adjudication of uh, visas over here, have uh, needed to amend and um, accommodate, you know, um, various different situations here. But let's just start with COVID before the Trump administration even order, uh, issued their audit. I mean, you know, as soon as COVID came out, the consulates around the world had various different closures and various different uh, prospects of when they will open. Uh, you know, while South Africa was still closed, we were still able to uh, process folks who were processing visas in um, in Mexico, and so on and so forth. So. Each consulate is unique and, you know, I encourage you to visit the, the U.S. consulates uh, of your area, uh, in this case, South Africa, Johannesburg, to determine, you know, when they will be opening. So, you know, whether or not you have an application uh, that is still in process or still in the works, COVID is going to delay that um, process in any event. And even if you did get a visa right before COVID, you know, they shut down the airline industry. So that in of itself, from a logistical point of view, is kind of where we're at from an immigration point of view. To add to that, the Trump administration, as you know, um, it went from a tweet to an actual proclamation where um, the president issued a proclamation with regards to stopping all immigration to the United States. And at first, when that tweet came out, uh, you know, I had a friend of mine who called me. He's in the McDonald's business. He's like, man, did I hear the president say he's going to stop all immigration? What are you going to do now? And I said, well, man, it's not, we don't only sell just Big Macs, you know, we sell a variety of other stuff too. So the long and the short of it is, is that, you know, even though this proclamation may have affected a small uh, um, amount of people, it really, in the bigger scheme of things, didn't really affect most. Because once the proclamation came out, I had to read it a couple of times to actually see who is excluded. And it seems like the only folks who are excluded are actually people who are outside the United States and who's awaiting for a green card um, interview for employment. And what is more specific is that the proclamation specifically carved out an exception for those who are EB-5. The whole premise about this proclamation was to say, hold on a second, our economy has been turned upside down. We have more unemployment now than we've ever, that we've had in a long time. So let's first kind of see what we can do to keep um, get the Americans back to work before we allow these new immigrants uh, uh, into the country, these with green cards who can literally work basically um, uh, anywhere. So those who applied for a DV lottery or got approved for that, those who applied for a work card, um, uh, uh, um, an employment-based uh, second or third preference category, uh, who has the employer waiting for them over here, those are some of the guys who were affected. But otherwise, nobody really else was um, affected by that. And what I keep telling people that, look, even though you may be in one of those situations where you are affected, if this, if this proclamation was not out, you would have still needed to wait until the consulate opens before we can move on forward. So really in all intents and purposes, I think at the end of the day, it really was just kind of a political move. Um, but I think also maybe something heading in the right direction just to make sure that we get the economy back up and going so that when you guys come over, um, you know, you'll find the opportunities that we've been enjoying here for the last couple of years. Yeah, well, certainly, uh, Leon, from a USCIS adjudication aspect, I mean, that department's still very active. Uh, I mean, we had one of our investors um, approval notice come through, I think it was on Friday, which uh, and yeah. we're expecting another batch of them through uh, shortly if we look at the, the timeline. So the back end is still working in essence. It's just really consular process that may be delayed. Yes. And in fact, uh, just at the local offices, the local offices are also working 
uh, they're just not open to the public. And uh, what I mean by that is, is uh, typically we'll have employment-based green cards interviewed and they have kind of waived those interviews uh, and just adjudicating those green cards without an interview. And as a, for instance, that, you know, they've started uh, interviewing. Uh, if I were to file as a US citizen for my mom or my dad, uh, they would interview that green card application as well. Those interviews are also waived. So it's really just those interviews in the United States that are kind of delayed that are marital based that I think that, or that they see some issues with that they would probably just wait until they open up to adjudicate this. But you're right. Otherwise, the Department of Labor has been moving forward. Uh, USCIS has been moving forward. And as you say, EB-5, it seems like, has also taken a turn with regards to not only moving forward, but also moving forward rapidly because of some changes with regards to the priority on how they are now adjudicating those in light of the fact that they are, they have moved uh, backlog countries uh, behind those that are, um, that are from not backlog countries like South Africa. Yeah, which is great news uh, for us here on the yeah. ground. Um, Leon, um, naturally the, a lot of questions are over and above EB-5 are the alternative visa categories that will get me into the US. So we're gonna deal with non-immigrant visas and then visas that uh, specifically are intent for immigration. But I think if we could just maybe brief, briefly talk through them, their merits in terms of the ability of those various visa categories to make them eligible for green card for permanent residency. Um, and then we'll focus on immigrant visas, which are designed to give you a clearer, easier, uh, least intrusive mechanism to physically immigrate and settle down the US. So you, you can talk sure. to non-immigrant. Yeah, sure. Look, so the word in of itself, non-immigrant, means that you're coming over here just for a temporary period of time. So these visas that is listed here on the slide is really kind of the more popular work visa types that we deal with. That doesn't mean that there's not a, a variety of others. All of these have to be sponsored by an employer. So if you are asking me whether or not I qualify for any one of these, we need to make sure that you have a U.S. employer who's going to be the vehicle that you're going to utilize in order to sponsor these visas. But let's just go through these. The first one is, the, is a very popular visa. It's called the H-1B visa. In this category, I need to show that the position requires the minimum of a bachelor's degree by Department of Labor standards and that you have the equivalent of a bachelor's degree. That could be uh, you know, a four-year degree that you got from the university in South Africa or a combination of work experience plus maybe a little bit of ex experience, uh, a little bit of education. The problem with this visa is, is that there's only 65,000 of these visas available per year. And this visa has come under great scrutiny because of the fact that it's been misused. Um, I mean, when you think about the giants like Tesla, uh, like, uh, Tesla Google, Facebook, uh, these are just some of the few names that utilize these visas for their IT personnel to come on over. Your chances of getting one of these visas are, are relatively slim. I mean, they, 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 they typically get about 200,000 applications when these visas become available per annum. So how these work is the immigration system has a fiscal year that runs from October till October. And the soonest that we can apply for an H-1B visa through your employer would be in April, six months before the, the actual visas become available. What they've done this year is, is they've put us, rather than putting us in the lottery system and having you file and only knowing in the summer, June, you know, whether or not your application was selected before it even gets adjudicated, they have had us all pre-register. And then through the pre-registration before April 1, we we're able to know whether or not immigration has accepted our case. This is significant because in the, uh, in the old days last year, if we had filed this application, I would have needed to prepare the complete application, file it lock, stock and barrel with immigration, make sure that it gets there on April 1, and then we'll only know in June or July whether or not your application was selected or not. So if it was selected, well, great, then we need to wait until October to see if it was approved and then you can only start in October. If it wasn't, well, then you've wasted all of this time where you could have probably pursued some other avenue in order to move forward. So the H-1B is really kind of an in-depth discussion that we have with an employer and with the employer to kind of see whether, where their objectives is and how quickly they need to be and see whether or not there's some other solutions to it. The H-1B is still a great option we utilize it. We file quite a lot of H-1Bs on, a, on an annual basis. We have clients that utilize this visa category quite extensively. And the majority of H-1B applicants are typically people who are in the United States who have now graduated, probably got some internship with a local company over here. Uh, and now that company really likes them. And uh, they want to find out, all right, how do we keep this guy on longer here? And they typically then apply for the H-1B. 
uh, they take their chance at this, at this point in time uh, to apply for it. And if it's successful, great. We can then, once it's filed, we can extend that um, internship until that visa gets approved in October. The other very popular one, I think I want to get to this one last, the L visa, because it's a, it's a, it's a visa that's it's very popular sorry. among South Africans. Is that good? Okay. Yeah, let's, talk, let's talk around the E2 treaty uh, visa. Uh, yes. Uh, so the E2, the typical conversation is, is really just, do you or your spouse have any other nationality other than South African? If the answer is no, then E2 is just not an option. It doesn't matter what kind of business you're going to open, how many people you're going to employ, how much you're going to do. None of that applies. The E2 is a, is a treaty visa wherein you need to be a citizen of a country that um, that has a treaty with the United States. Now, as for instance, Spain, often, oftentimes the golden visa uh, opportunities, people would find a roundabout way to obtain you know, citizenship from one of these treaty countries in order to ultimately end up in the United States. Now, you know, once you do an analysis, it's really kind of um, kind of a roundabout way to really kind of find yourself, uh, you know, spinning your wheels. And I'll get to that, uh, why I say that in a, in a, in a second. But how the E2 visa typically works is, is I'll give a typical example. I have a South African who's a CEO of a company. He's a South African. But his wife has, a, for instance, maybe someone from Switzerland. So his wife, who is a Swiss national, could open up a company in the United States. Doesn't need to have any relationship between the two. Open up a company in the United States where she will then ultimately employ uh, the South African guy to come and work there. So as the as the as she is the the majority owner of this uh, company in the United States, it enables her to utilize this E2 visa for her to come on over as the principal beneficiary. Her spouse, who would be coming over, will be coming as a derivative, but because he's a derivative of an E2, will get him an employment authorization. With the employment authorization, he's then able to work for this company. So that's how we've been able to get around. Um, folks, you know, from South Africa who has different nationalities. Now, the only exception here is for folks who have, and this is the typical example of South Africans who have dual nationality with the UK. Yep. The UK is the only country that requires you to have actually physically lived in the UK for you to qualify for this E2 visa. So there needs to be a physical time that you need to go spend in the United States before you can then initiate this E2 visa from there in order to come to the United States. So here's how it works. You set up this company in the uh, in will have an extensive business plan that explains how this works uh, and how you will set it up. There is no minimum investment requirement for the E2 visa. There's no minimum amount of jobs that you need to create for the E2 visa. And the reason is, is because their broad term is just as long as your company is not marginal. And really what that boils down to is if you are coming over here, like my Pakistani clients, to buy a gas station, the capital that you're going to need to put in is far more than my IT guy who's coming from South Africa, who's coming to set up an IT company over here and have a small office that he's going to run from and maybe a few uh, you know, subcontractors that he's going to use. So from a variety of a guy who needs $500,000, $300,000 to in infuse for his gas station to a guy who maybe needs 50000 So there's quite a few folks out there that would tell you, no, you need a minimum of $100,000 in order to do the E2 visa. And I say that's not the, tr it's not the case. It boils down to with regards to what your business in the United States needs are. And ultimately, a business plan will show that it's not going to be marginal based upon your projections and how you're going to move forward. Now, ultimately, you want to obviously employ some U.S. citizens so as to grow the company. There needs to be shown growth. But once you get this visa, you don't even need to deal with USCIS here in the, in, in, in the country. We deal exclusively with the consulate. I send you to the consulate. They have an interview with you. They'll already review your application with the business plan and everything else. And at that interview, they give you a visa sticker for you, your spouse, and your kids under 21, and you come on over. And the moment you set foot here, we'll apply for a work authorization for your spouse. But here's the catch. Here's the catch that I think that sometimes bites people uh, in the in the ox skin, right? In the shin. Oh. Two things. Number one, this e visa doesn't lead to permanent residency, and that's the biggest thing you need to understand. It is perpetual in nature, which means that once the e visa expires three years, five years from now, I can renew it as long as your company is still doing good and it's still floating and it's still strong uh, financially wise. Number two, if you have a kid that 
is getting to turn 21 or growing, you know, as this girl, at some point he's going to fall off as a derivative. He can only derive this benefit from the e-visa for as long as he or she is turned 21. Once he turns 21, he would need to, if he wants to remain in the United States, either get on a student visa or find some other independent immigration benefit that he or she would need to see. There are some alternatives, obviously, on how you can move from an e-visa to a green card, but it's not the typical way. Some of the folks that we've helped have been in the United States for X amount of time, but they've built up some capital in the United States through their company. And through this capital, they've made, as a, for instance, perhaps an EB-5 investment. And through this EB-5 investment, they've been able to obtain permanent residency. So they will then switch from e-visa to permanent residency. But this company on the e-visa is not able to sponsor the employer, uh, the, the employee uh, for that uh, principal benefit. The other benefit of the e-visa is obviously, is if you have a large corporation, every citizen from that, from that country, in this case, Switzerland, if you want to have people uh, employed at your company in, uh, in the U.S., as long as they are Swiss national, they're coming over to, to fulfill a skilled work or uh, fulfill a managerial or executive capacity, they can come on over uh, and work on an e-visa and the same with their, uh, their family. So we have some Japanese and German clients, some big, uh, big companies, that this is exactly what they do. They just run on the e-visa to, to have their folks come in and out. And at some point in time, if they want to do permanent residency, we do it through a, through a different mechanism in order to help, those, uh, to help those folks. But the e-visa, like I say, as great as it, as it is, there is quite a few things that you need to know. Number one, it doesn't uh, lead necessarily to permanent residency, and that's usually where the first conversation needs to, the conversation of immigration needs to start. What is your end game? If your end game is just to come in and out for an extensive period of time, not permanently stay here, which is maybe 0.5% of the people that I meet, then non-immigrant visas, and these are all good options. But let's start in talking about what's your permanent solution and how we're going to get there and then work our way to where we will start today. So that's kind of the e-visa in a nutshell. Perfect, Leon. Um, that's a pretty good overview. I mean, as you know, um, a lot of these Caribbean uh, opportunities are quite aggressively promoted in South Africa with the objective that uh, by virtue of it, uh, being a Grenadian uh, passport holder, that you would be able to get easy access into the US through the E2 uh, waiver, visa waiver program. Leon, I think let's now maybe focus a little bit around the L visa. Um, the L visa has been a very popular option, certainly uh, many, many years ago. Um, it was most probably one of the easier ways to get in, but it's gone through a lot of uh, transformation and it's, it's come under a fair amount of scrutiny uh, of late in respect of um, its adjudication. But Leon, we, we may well be uh, starting in a, an alternative sort of visa, visa option, which we're gonna collectively be promoting. So maybe let's spend a bit of time around the L, okay. L visa and its benefits. Sure, so just to that point, I'll start at the end and then work my way to the beginning. Um, I would have said um, seven, eight years ago, 10 years ago, if you would come to me and say, I want to do an EB-5 or an L visa, I would say you would be silly to invest all that kind of money uh, where I can get you a green card faster through an L visa. But as Stuart has said, you know, this has come under great scrutiny and it has become very, very problematic uh, in order to go that route now, just based upon the way immigration is adjudicating these cases. But let's go over the, we'll do an overview of what the minimum requirements for these L visa is. Number one, as I said, with all of these non-immigrant visas, you need to have a U.S. company who's going to sponsor you. So with the L visa, what will need to happen is you will need to set up, if you have your own company in South Africa or you're the majority owner, the company in South Africa would need to set up a branch affiliate or subsidiary in the United States. Right? So this will then become the legal vehicle that will sponsor the people from, uh, from each branch subsidiary or its qualifying company. So that's the first thing that needs to happen. We need to build this tunnel between the two qualifying companies. Number two, the person that you are moving over from the foreign company needs to have worked for that foreign company for at least one out of the last three years. So in some cases, the reason why I mention that is because in some cases, some guys have sold off on a company and they have, may not work there anymore, but they worked there at least two, two years ago. They would still qualify under this criteria if that company that they sold 
would want to have the guy go over to the United States. These are some real examples. Go over to the United States to kind of instigate that in order to get that going. So you must have worked for the foreign company for at least one out of the last three years in a manager or executive capacity. And then number three, if you're coming to the United States and you're opening up a new business, we need to have, you need to have this new business need to have secured a physical presence. So people would say like, well, Leon, you're asking me to put the cart before the horse, buying a plane ticket before I even know if I'm going to have a visa, those kind of situations. The law specifically require on a new business that you need to have secured physical presence. So these are the three main criteria. Now, nothing in the law says how many people you need to employ. Nothing in the regulations says how much money you need to invest. I need to be clear about that because there's quite a few people that says, well, if you're going to do an LBG, you need to at least employ 10 people. You need to at least you know, invest so much money. There's nothing in the regulations that require that. And the reason why these people would oftentimes say that is because of how immigration has gone about adjudicating these cases from small businesses to big businesses. And what immigration does is from a small business point of view, they emphasize on the description of the executive that you're bringing over. So you would have been an executive in South Africa, run that company that employs a hundred people or whatever the case may be. And you're going to come over here and you're maybe going to employ three people at the first year. And then they take issue with regards to, despite the fact that I have gone down the re regulatory criteria of what an executive does, he has wide latitude of discretion making. Uh, he has the ability to hire and fire. In fact, I even show examples of how this executive has used that wide latitude of discretion making, binding the company in the US in signing a lease agreement. True examples. And immigration will still come back and they will say, well, hold on a second. This is all fine and dandy that you elaborate and regurgitate the, the regulations back to us and how it applies to your guide. But we need, to, then they assume that because it's only one or two guys that he also does non-executive duties because I didn't elaborate on who is, who is in charge for picking up the mail, who is in charge for picking, you know, making the phone calls and so on and so forth. And so each business is unique on what their needs are. And you would need to specifically outline to the immigration officer specifically what your business does and why it is that your business only needs one employee. I'll give real examples of South Africans a guy who buys and sells planes. He's had a tourist visa for who knows how long. And he's been buying and selling these private jets, being a broker for quite some time. That he's done in South Africa and he's been an international broker. We did an L visa for this guy. And guess how many people are on his payroll? He happens to employ his wife. Good luck with that, but anyway. So it's just the two of them. I'll use another example. A guy who, who um, comes over and knocks out dents. He hires some subcontractors over here. Guess how many people are on his payroll? Two people. So the reason why I bring up these examples is, is because just to overemphasize that the regulations, number one, is silent about how much money you need to invest. And it also is silent about how many people you need to employ. But when you are in a smaller environment, you need to understand that you take a greater risk to try to convince this guy at immigration who's got a different hat on now, who is assuming that you're going to be doing non-executive duties too, to explain to this guy why it is that non-executive non duties are, as a, for instance, done by subordinates or non-executive duties are not applicable in your situation. I mean, a guy knocking out dents doesn't necessarily need too much, guys. And a guy selling planes only needs maybe somebody to pick up the, the phone. So you will in your business plan, and this is why you emph emphasize so that a business plan is so important, whether or not it's a new business or not, to outline and explain to the immigration officer exactly how all of these gears fit together. So that's the number one thing. So when people ask me how much money I need to invest, I'll say your business plan will outline to us how much money you are investing, if it's going to be sufficient or not for purposes of what you're doing. The other thing that I think is also important is, is when you come on over, people say, well, you know what, let me just um, lease something temporarily. If you're coming over and you are selling stuff that you're going to be importing from South Africa and you just have like a little front office, it's going to be difficult to explain to immigration that you meet the regulatory criteria that the premise that you've secured is sufficient. I mean, you need to secure a premise that houses a warehouse so that once, once your visa is approved and once all of this is going on, 
Where are you going to house that? It's not something that's going to happen in the future. All of this needs to happen up front. So if you want to structure your business plan where you're going to come over here and set up an agency to explore, and within the first year after that, the place that you've rented is going to have the ability to expand and so on and so forth. But you need to write off the offset on this new visas, explain to immigration why your premise is sufficient. Here's yeah. the biggest yeah. caveat that I have with the yeah. L visas. Yeah. Just one, I'll give you one sure. second. The biggest question, the biggest caveat that I have with L visas when I talk to South Africans is you need to have a strong stomach. And what I mean by that is, is that if you come over on a new, new company visa, immigration by law is only going to give you a one year visa. Now coming to the United States, setting up a new business and making sure that that business works is in of itself, aside from immigration, a daunting task. And so you are going to take on this task to come to the United States to set up a business and in the hopes that it's going to be uh, fruitful and in the hopes that it's going to grow as your business plan is outlined and so on and so forth. And you're going to put a lot of eggs in these baskets. And God forbid you've got your whole family over here because everybody is going to be hoping that once we get to the renewal stage where the kids have now settled into school by then, the wife is happy with the neighbors that she's made friends of because everybody likes her accent and that she likes the, they all like the milk tart that she makes. You're going to have a real difficult time at that first year to convince immigration to extend that visa because immigration approved your initial visa. It doesn't necessarily mean that an extension is grant, you know, is a given. And so a lot of folks, you know, uh, stumble across that. And so what we do preemptively, if this is your only option, it preemptively, we look five years ahead. Our business plan talks five years ahead. And remember, a business plan is only something that you plan. And immigration understands, believe it or not, they understand that things don't always work according to plan, but you have contingencies. This is not something that you do uh, to get out of Dodge. This is something that you do with immigration being a side issue to it. And if you focus it on that way, your chances of success going through this is much greater. When you focus on the business with the immigration thing set aside and you focus on how that's going to be a success and how you need to roll it out for the next five years, your chances of success is much greater in, in my experience. Because then what immigration is asking us comes natural. I don't need to think up things. I don't need to, you know, <laughs> that I had, I had a colleague <laughs> recommend to someone, just go buy a hundred computers and, you know, um, to show immigration that, you know, you've invested a lot of money into inventory. I said, well, what are you going to do with 100 computers? Well, I don't know. I'll probably sell it. I'm like, well, so that's really kind of the big issue. Now, one of the things that we've been working on uh, is, uh, along with Stuart and the company that we've worked on uh, with before, is guys who have done EB-5 before has gone in, and, and especially in today's economy in the United States, they've gone and they've um, acquired, uh, looked to acquire businesses, existing businesses. and there's there's quite a few criteria that we work with them around on what that business needs to look like from an immigration point of view, if you want to use that as a vehicle. But the benefit of that is, is if you buy into an existing business, aside from the business model that you need to evaluate from a due diligence point of view and making sure that that's your number one criteria again, and that that's going to work. But from an immigration point of view, the benefit that it serves to you is twofold. Number one, the first visa I'm going to get you and your family is for three years, not just one year. Number two, the greatest benefit is, is once you step foot into the country, you already have a business that is generating some income for you. Because, man, I tell you what, especially now with Iran, I don't know where it's tilting at. At some point it was 18, 19. Coming over here with your Rands is very, very difficult to kind of start making a living. And on top of that, running a business from over here, especially if it's a small, small shop. So if you have an existing business that you're tapping in and that you've done your vetting and your due diligence on, you come in with a three-year visa. And the most important benefit of it is, is that this business, we will also evaluate and see how soon we can apply for you for permanent residency. And we'll get to that here on our next slide when we talk about immigrant visas. So the acquisition of an existing business may be something to consider to eliminate the uh, issue with regards to that new visa that may or may not get approved, but even if it does get approved, getting renewed, that buys you at least a three-year time frame during that time frame to apply for permanent residency and kind of put that whole thing to bed. But that's going to be in a nutshell on how the L visas work. 
you need to have an intercompany transfer. Now, one of the one of the important things that I think goes without saying, the word intercompany transfer means that the South African company needs to remain in existence. Yeah, you can't come over here and then all of a sudden the South African company just goes down the drain. I mean, these guys will at the consulate through the consulate and you know, the, the the fraud unit that they have over there they will go knocking on a door over there in south africa and making sure that, that business is still operational if they have to or if they suspect something and they've done that in the past so your south african company needs to remain in existence doesn't necessarily need to turn a huge pro profit or whatever the case may be but it still needs to take over that also doesn't mean it just needs to be a shell company right it needs to pass the smell test but more importantly is that this existence, the, the existing relationship between the two companies needs to remain in existence at least until such time that you uh, obtain permanent residency. On the L visa, Leon, discuss, I think, yes, please go ahead. I, I, I'm just trying to manage a bit of time, Leon. I think that oh, sure. we've, we've dealt with the L visa quite extensively. Um, okay. I think in a nutshell, it comes with its own set of challenges um, and one would need to brace yourself. It's certainly a visa category where one should prepare yourself for a, for a number of what we call RFEs, requests for further evidence. But yeah. certainly if you designed it slightly differently to how it's traditionally been promoted in South Africa, which is mm -hmm. a new business model that uh, myself and Leon are going into, which is where it's a uh, visa by acquisition on the back end of an L, um, it's probability in terms of having too many hurdles may be slightly less complicated. So certainly the L visa is, uh, is, is, is a really good option for South Africans. I just want to focus on one person's question, Leon, that's come through just before we go into the immigrant visa. It's, it's a question from Maria. Um, I'd like to find out more about the alien with exceptional ability visa, as I've read through the criteria and fulfilled 10 out of the 10 of the criteria. Is it hard to get it now? And are those visas frozen? Also, how does it work with dependence derivatives of the alien? Okay, sure. We can get right into it. The O visa is one where you only need to meet three out of the 10 criteria. And it's typically for those who have extraordinary, extraordinary ability. Huh? I say she's got 10 out of 10. She's there. Well, <laughs> great. So, um, you know, uh, it is typically, as a, uh, the example that I typically use, uh, it is for people in the business, uh, in arts and in sports. And a typical example is the guy is someone who has reached um, a high level of extraordinary ability in a specific field. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have been a gold medal winner at the Olympics. But it, someone who can qualify is someone who is a springbok, who is going to compete in the Olympics or who's just represented this country as a for instance. Because one of the things that I need to show is that you won some national or international awards. Or, or international awards. So if you want some national awards, those need to be some significant awards, right? That's one of the criteria. The other criteria is obviously if you have, if you're a member of an exclusive group that requires outstanding achievements of its members. So as a for instance, I don't pay a fee to go be a member of the Springboks. I get invited to be a member of the Springbok team because of my extraordinary ability. All right, and also if you've been published. In other words, the report has, you know, interviewed me uh, before, super sport have interviewed me before on, you know, on my extraordinary ability field. Those are some of the three popular criteria that you've made. And obviously, depending on what kind of field you're doing, we've, we do a lot of these EB1s for uh, sports people. We also do a lot of them for business people and also uh, for those in the arts, classical musicians and so on and so forth. Yeah. But this will kind of just be something off the side that we could probably evaluate for you and quickly ascertain. As it pertains to your question, no, they're not, they are, they are, they are not excluded. This process, the, the timing of this EB1s is also now current. So once you file the application, it will probably take about four to six months until premium processing comes back in. You don't need an employer for this. You can file it by, you, you can file it without a US sponsor. And uh, once you get that approved, you, your spouse and your kids under 21 will gain the benefit of that 10 year permanent residency. Perfect, Leon. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, Leon, now we're going to focus on immigrant visas. So what I call the easier path uh, and less intrusive mechanism to getting a green card and eventually being naturalized. So obviously, most probably the easiest one that's relatively cheap and free is the DB uh, uh, lottery. So do you want to just talk about that? I mean, 
I always Another encourage every, anybody, doesn't matter if you already have a green card pending or in the process of applying, just apply for, for, for the DV lottery. And the most important word that Stuart used there was the word free. Anybody yep. who charges you for this, it's a scam. The word .gov should give you a good indication that you're on the right track with regards to subscribing and registering for the DV lottery. We don't do a lot of DV lottery stuff, but I always encourage people to apply for the DV lottery. I know a lot of South Africans here who have won the, the lottery and has come over here. It's something that I encourage you to apply for because this is definitely one of those green card categories that if the Trump administration has its way that they're going to do away with. Yep, I agree. Perfect. Leon, uh, family-based immigration. Uh, naturally, a lot of our South Africans have, have got family that are in the U.S., um, just a very quick, brief overview. Um, sure. There may be a daughter or a son who are now green card holders that would like to bring their parents over, or there may be a brother or a sister or an uncle. Let's start with the U.S. citizens. So the U.S. Yep. citizens, they can sponsor a brother and sister. Uh, I looked here on my phone. They are now processing stuff that was filed in 2007. So you're going to wait a long time. You can't come to the United States and wait that time out. You need to wait until that visa category becomes current. If that's an option, it's also definitely something I you know, encourage you to maybe even pursue, despite the fact that it may take long, because it's a category that they're also contemplating of doing away with. So if you've got a brother and sister who's a U.S. citizen, they can sponsor you. The other category is obviously if you get married to a U.S. citizen. There yep. is no wait. So you go through the normal adjudication timeframes, and as soon as it's approved, you, know, you, you hop on over. With the other categories that I've mentioned, like brother and sister, it's a preference category, which means that there are only certain amount of green cards allocated for these preference <coughs> categories. So citizens, brother and sister, citizen, husband and wife, and citizens who can sponsor mom and dad. So citizens who can sponsor mom and dad is almost the equivalent of sponsoring a spouse. There's also no wait. You just hop through all the adjudication timeframes. Once you file it, gets approved, you go to the consulate, no wait, there's no preference category, come on over. Yeah, the you know, that's, other, quite, that's yeah. quite important because often with our EB-5 investors, uh, when we look at the family unit, um, in some cases, we actually will make the children uh, what we call the primary applicant. The child will go through the immigration process, get the green card, settle down in the U.S., get employed. And then over a period of time, because there's no urgency for the parents, the parents can then simply get sponsored in. It's a mechanism whereby you don't necessarily have to do two EB-5 investments to facilitate the, the same uh, end objective. So we always look at the family dynamics before we engage and design a model and a visa category that is best suited for that family unit. So just to get to citizenship, uh, on a side note here, you have to be a permanent resident. No other visa category. You have to be a permanent resident for five years before you can become eligible for citizenship. First criteria. Second criteria, you need to have accumulated at least two and a half years of time in the United States. Not consecutively, but accumulatively. The only guy who gets a shortcut that only needs to wait three years is someone who's married to a U.S. citizen. But yeah, citizens, they can sponsor mom and dad. They can sponsor uh, sons and daughters over and under 21. And they can also sponsor a brother and sister. Believe it or not, oftentimes I get people who are in the United States on permanent, as permanent resident. And they say, hey, I want to sponsor my kid. It's over 21. Um, and I want to bring them over. Uh, I'll be coming as a citizen here pretty soon. And I say, just hold on a second before we make you a citizen. The assumption may be that a citizen can get his son over 21 to permanent residency faster than someone who's a permanent resident. Well, unfortunately, it's not always the case. By looking at the visa bulletin that gets published every month, there have been often times where we have found that permanent residents can sponsor their kids over 21, married by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Um, and that, that process can sometimes go faster than it would if you were um, a citizen. But anyway, so permanent residents who can also sponsor spouses and they can also sponsor kids under 21. Those categories are usually relatively current. You know, uh, right now I'm looking at the bulletin and it's March 20th, which is just last month. So you can also just hop through the adjudication hoops or you can sponsor your kids over 21. That time frame just takes a little bit longer. So those are the family preference categories in order to get people uh, over here. All right, then we're gonna just run very quickly through the employment-based ones, the EB ones, uh, and then if we could just dedicate about 10 minutes to uh, EB-5 earlier. 
Perfect. So there's a, there's a variety of categories under employment-based categories. So uh, EB just stands for employment-based and you get category one. This is the extraordinary uh, question that we just had a question of. There's a subcategory under EB1 that also deals with multinational executives. This is how you then move from L visa to green card. You will fall under that EB1 category. Then you've got EB2, people with um, exceptional ability. So it's just kind of a step down from extraordinary ability. You still need a, uh, you need a US sponsor for that. Um, and also people with advanced or master's degrees fulfilling positions in the United States that require master's degrees. EB3 categories is people um, with skilled workers. Uh, so we typically fit our farmers that we are helping in the EB3 uh, or uh, other category in order to help these guys come on over. There's an extensive process that you go through in order to get to that point where you need to deal with the Department of Labor for about a year, proving that you can't find a US citizen who's willing, able and qualified to do the job. So your US employer who ultimately wants to hire you will hop through all these hoops file the immigrant petition and then see what the priority dates are in order to get you to the consulate or if you're here on an H2A or any other visa, we'll be able to switch you over. So it takes some time, uh, you know, in order to hop through those hoops, but that's how we are helping quite a lot of farmers who are in the United States and moving over. We've got a ca category for religious workers. There's certain criteria that, uh, that relates to that from the R visa, which is the religious worker visa to the, to the green card. And then we've got the fifth preference category. This is the EB-5 that is divided in two. The first one is obviously if you do a direct investment of $1.8 million, you are in charge of creating your jobs. You've got this company set up um, in the United States and it's running. The adjudication timeframes are those are just extraordinarily long, over 45 months, sometimes even longer on that first category. But then also the second part of the EB-5 is where you invest with a regional center a company that has already gone to immigration and said, hey, I'm building this hotel uh, in this particular area and the governor of this state has designated this area where I'm building my hotel as a targeted employment area, which means that it's an area where the unemployment is a little bit higher than the national average. And by my infusion into the economy over there, I'm going to be creating 10 direct and indirect jobs and immigration evaluates that before they even go to the investor and approves them as a regional center so that they can go ask uh, foreign investors for EB-5 um, uh, investments. Yeah, Leon, I mean, um, we're running out of time and I'm conscious about uh, not keeping people online for more than an hour, but just in a nutshell, maybe some of the benefits of, of the EB-5 is um, there's no English exam, so there's no uh, language barrier. Uh, there's no minimum education amount. There's no specific employment or management experience required. So in other words, you do not need uh, sponsorship. Uh, there are no visa backlogs. Um, uh, funding, funding for the uh, investment can come from a gift, inheritance, uh, business ownership, or any other lawful activity. Um, and really, there's only three, three criteria. One, you've got to be a moral good standing. Two, we've got to ensure that um, your funds have come from a uh, legitimate source. And thirdly, you need to be investing into a regional center, hopefully, which has got track record and meets all the, the relevant uh, criteria from an immigration aspect. We obviously have had huge success with the EB-5 investment visa program um, over the years. Um, it certainly is a, a very passive way of getting in, but without doubt guarantees that you're going to get to the, to the final uh, end line. Um, and certainly, we've never ever had a failure. We've never ever had a capital failure. Um, and it really gets you through, through that door quite swiftly. Um, in terms of processing times, we currently are looking at processing adjudications. We had one, like I said, to, said earlier, of just on 12 months, which was approved last month. But our average processing turnaround time is between 18 and 20 months. Um, but Leon, we're not going to go into too much detail. We've dealt with a number of other visa categories. Um, this is just basically a investment timeline. Typically, your funds uh, in an EB-5 investment are held for five years from the date that we file you with immigration. So typically, before we start, we sit down with you. We do an, an analysis of exactly what your objectives are to ensure that the EB-5 is the correct mechanism for you to go through. At the same time, we would introduce you to Leon. Uh, we like to have clients that are legally engaged with an immigration council because we literally start sharing documents. 
Um, as I said, the most intrusive aspect of this application really revolves around source of funds. So we dig in deep um, and we try and track back the origin of those funds that are either offshore, we need to establish how they got offshore, or if they're in this NSA on their way to the project, we obviously need to make sure that they go through SARP clearance and then look at how they were derived. Um, Leon then prepares your file, he files it with immigration, and it then goes through what's called an adjudication process. Um, and as I said, at the moment, we're getting adjudications roughly between 18 and 20 months. You get approved. Once again, we re-engage with Leon. We prepare you for the consular interview, which is really just a formality. Your file moves from the USCIS to the National Visa Center, and Leon's got a great relationship with them. Somehow he's able to track when these things are getting uh, ready for consular dates. Um, we then, yep. We then uh, meet with you a couple of days before your physical consular process. We uh, will sort of go through some of the common questions that they will pose, but it's really just a formality. Um, you're then issued with a temporary immigrant visa that is valid for six months, and you then need to make your first entry into the United States. The day that you arrive and get an entry stamp into your passport, for all intents and purposes, you are deemed to be a permanent resident, and you're on your way to naturalization. The only additional criteria is that from the day that you made that first entry, is that your capital needs to remain invested for a further two years. So the capital retention is roughly five years. Uh, during that time period, there's a nominal return. That typically, the, the returns um, uh, vary from 0.5% to 2% on an annual basis. And that's just because the EB-5 investment visa was, it's an ends to a means. You should not be taking any uh, economic risk because you're piggybacking on a developer or sponsor equity. Um, who is using portion of your funds for his, uh, his capital stack. He's going to develop, by virtue of, a, of him developing, he's creating um, job creation, which is a criteria in, in respect to the EB-5 investment uh, program. Um, he stabilizes the building, he refinances because he's issued stock to you, um, and he then pays you back your capital with your nominal return. So money goes in, you I'm going to use the word guaranteed uh, a green card because we've never had a failure, but certainly in the event that you did not get approved, your funds are uh, immediately paid back to you. <coughs> there are underwriting programs that are attached to the underwriting in terms of the return of capital. Benefits. Once you've made that first entry into the US, even prior to you getting the green card, which normally takes about six weeks, you have all the rights and benefits of an American citizen, except you can't vote until you're naturalized. So lifestyle, college and tuition. And this has really been quite a draw card for a lot of our South Africans, um, is the tuition benefits. Um, Leon, do you want to maybe just talk? Because I, I know it's, it's quite a popular subject. For sure. uh, I mean, look, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, the typical example is just the, the doctor. Uh, you know, he's, uh, he's not coming over here on a green card to start all his practice all over again and go back to school again all over. So <clears throat> he's doing this merely for his for his kids who may not even get admission into South African University. So he's going to come to the United States in any of it. As an international student, you pay the highest tuition that any student in the United States will pay. And so if you have permanent residency, you then qualify for, I wouldn't say out of state tuition or in state tuition, but it is definitely not international student uh, uh, tuition. So you get a significant reduction in your tuition cost coming over as a permanent resident. But here's the biggest benefit that we have seen is oftentimes when people, when kids are here as students, is that find some opportunities because, you know, an American unfortunately can't see an opportunity even if someone were to hit them with a two by four against the head with it. But South Africans just in the nature of their opportunistic uh, means would see opportunities and that's what the American employer likes. They find opportunities here, they graduate at the top of their class and what happens if they don't have permanent residency, that employer is then stuck with, what? Applying for an H-1B visa where there's only 65,000 available. So once the kid is in school, if he has a green card, he can go work and flip, you know, and, and work a little bit on the side. If he doesn't have a green card and a student visa, he can't work. If he has a green card, any opportunity that he finds as far as a job is concerned post-graduation, he doesn't need to worry about an H-1B or whatever the case may be. He literally just keeps on moving and moving up. So these have been a significant 
benefit to a lot of the EB5 folks and some of them that have basically moved some of their portfolio around and said, look, I've got this money stuck over here. Yes, it may yield me a little bit of a benefit from an investment point of view but as a return, but I could rather move this money in, 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 uh, over here and get the benefit with regards to saving money on tuition, with regards to increasing the opportunities for my kids who's going to be studying and ultimately once they graduate, finding opportunities in the United States. Yeah. Also, uh, Leon, you know, on the EB-5, but it allows a lot of um, constructive time planning uh, for a family that is uh, considering immigration because in a lot of the cases, our South Africans have got very large businesses. They've got very large property portfolios that are going to take a long, a long period of time to unbundle. Yeah. All the, 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 in fact, the business may still be profitable and they would like to really um, you know, earn out of their business for as long as possible. So the EB-5 is a very nice mechanism to 100% ensure that you've got a green card in your hand and then through different mechanisms like the re-entry permit, in fact, he doesn't have to physically be on the soil in the US. He can manage his business fairs here in South Africa for as long as they are uh, prosperous for himself and then at the appropriate time uh, move move across and settle down and retire and enjoy all the various lifestyle um, uh, lifestyles attached to, to it's one investment there. for the entire family so yep. it's one investment for you your spouse and all your kids under 21 i just thought that i'd mention that because we've had that question correct um and certainly with the sponsor equity that we deal with um we don't look at the eb5 as just the mechanism to get you the green card we really are looking for a longer term relationship for you with you um, EB-5 is only just one aspect uh, that we get involved in. Uh, a lot of my EB-5 clients have become just pure direct equity investors in a lot of the schemes that we do that are non-EB-5 related. And that's just by virtue of nurturing a relationship. A couple of our, our most recent uh, projects, uh, which uh, Chris from Pam Golding has been involved with us. Um, one was Hollywood Circle. This is in the state of Florida in a town called Hollywood which is just four miles uh, south of Fort Lauderdale. A $240 million CapEx project, uh, fully funded, it's completed, it's in a stabilized position, uh, running exceptionally well. Diagonally across the road was one called Block 40, also mixed use development. It has a CapEx of $140 million. It's under construction, currently going vertical. Um, only South Africans uh, that were involved in that scheme, we didn't raise any EB-5 money from any other jurisdictions. Um, we then went to a city slightly closer to Lyon called Kansas. Uh, we were involved in the redevelopment of an old gentleman's club into a hotel. That project is currently almost finalized in respect of its um, uh, refurbishment. Um, it's in a great location in the, the new town in where the RCC is. Um, and then we went to Chicago to a suburb called Arlington, where we completed a subscription, purely only South Africans, and that was a just short of a $100 million CapEx project, and it was only South Africans that subscribed, um, and that was a multifamily uh, unit. Um, this is the one, Arlington is the one where we got uh, the approval last week, and we're expecting uh, most of our South African approvals to pop through pretty quickly there afterwards. But that's it in a nutshell. It's, we've painted quite a broad picture in respect of COVID during immigration during COVID, other immigration options uh, over and above the EB-5 program. Um, and now we're going to go into a Q&A session. I am conscious about time, but we can answer maybe a couple of questions. I've got one. Hi, can I travel to the US without me having any family living for me in the US? Uh, uh, Leon, I think that that is a question um, relating to can I go on a B1B2, I'm assuming. I guess anybody can travel to the United States if you have the appropriate visa. So if you're coming and what the purpose of your travel is, if you're coming over as a visitor, and you're from a country that requires a visa, then you need a B1, B2. Otherwise, if you're from a country that does not require a visa, you'll register to come in on ESTA, Visa Waiver Program. So yeah, you can travel without your family. Yeah. And in fact, everyone is their own independent um, 
applicant you know uh, so if you come over with your family it's possible that they will let you in but maybe not your family if your family member yeah. has a criminal matter uh, you know i think i need to just highlight there's a lot of scrutinization around uh, on entry nowadays on the b1 b2 um mm -hmm. so you know if you're going in for business purposes you need to be you need to be honest uh, if you're going in for leisure you need to tell them it's for leisure um, there's certainly a lot of scrutiny that's taking place and certainly uh, intense scrutinization at the consular uh, process for all visa categories. Uh, the U.S. consulate is very much aware of our plight here, um, and they're looking for people that are trying to uh, hop on a plane and get over on the other side and uh, not be there in the correct legal status. Um, Leon, we've got a, a question from Carl. Uh, a P1 sports visa issued on a three-year basis expires in July 2021. When does the renewal process begin? Six and months. what is important Carl. to know? Yeah, uh, Carl, uh, I think if it's the same Carl, I think I helped him. Six months before, beforehand, you know, when the rugby season starts back up. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, is he a rugby player? If it's the same Carl. Okay, it must be. <laughs> All right, uh, Leon, another question. A scenario where a South African currently in SA is legally married. I like the way he puts the legally married to a U.S. citizen who resides in the U.S. What is the, what is the final stage or phase of visa application interview, which was, which was supposed to be concluded in Johannesburg in April 2020? Um, obviously, with COVID lockdown, yeah. uh, an interview has now been moved to July 2020. How yeah. will this scenario possibly pay, play out? So you will go for your interview at the scheduled time, make sure your medicals are in order. Um, that's up to date, your police clearances. Um, and then they'll ask you 20 questions with regards to the legitimacy of this marriage and the bona fide nature of it. Uh, if they're happy with it, they will keep your passport, um, send it back to you with an immigrant visa sticker. And with that, you will have six months to make your entry into the United States as a permanent resident. If you've been married to the US citizen for less than two years, at the time of, of adjudication, you will only get a conditional green card, good for two years. You will then, before that two years expire, go back to immigration, you and your spouse, and explain to them the marriage is still happily ever after. Maybe you've got some kids in the meantime, but you'll need to remove that condition uh, of your green card to get permanent residency. Once you step foot in the country, like I mentioned before, being married to a US citizen, independent from this two-year criteria, there's a the three-year time clock that will start running towards obtaining citizenship. Perfect, Leon. And then one from JP. Um, how much time do you need to spend in the US once the visa is approved? Does it need to be permanent? Uh, that's actually so, a very good question. Yeah, yeah, good question. I think it's not really a matter of how much time you spend in the United States as much as it is how much time you spend outside the United States. There's a rebuttable presumption if you're out of the United States for six months that you've abandoned, abandoned your permanent residency. This could easily be overcome by filing at what is called a re-entry permit. Uh, we do this quite often with some of the soccer players that we represent who takes on a contract in Europe. They want to ultimately stay in the United States, but they just don't want to go fly back and forth during the soccer season to keep their green card alive. So we file this re-entry permit. It allows you to stay out of the country for two years as a permanent resident without questions being asked. Once you come back in, use your re-entry permit and your green card and your passport, and they say, welcome back. It's a great mechanism. We certainly use the re-entry permit quite, quite, quite a lot earlier. Um, another question from Nico. I want to open up a business in the US. I will be exporting goods from SA to the US. Okay. What do I need to know before I can start? Um, well, I am ready to move on this and want to get, get to the US to test the market and sell some of the projects directly as a first step. What are the implications? I will be selling the product and receiving money for it. My visa won't allow. I think what he's mentioned, he's currently on a B1, B2, but obviously would like to test the waters. Um, I'm contemplating taking the chance to test the market over there. Maybe not wise, your input would be valued. Yeah, so I think it's probably something to be discussed offline to make sure that I understand the specifics of the question. But in general, you know, nothing prevents you as a business person to come over and uh, do due diligence on your business that you're planning on setting up in the United States. You know, you cannot be employed by a company in the United States because you won't, under a tourist visa, have uh, authorization to be employed. And some people say, well, you know, I'm just going to be, I have my own company and I'm not going to be employed. Well, inherently, if you are directing the company, then inherently you are deployed, employed whether or not you get a salary check or not, uh, a paycheck or not. 
So it's probably something that I need more information on, but yeah, for sure. I mean, companies do that all the time. They can send someone over here to do due diligence on where they want to do it, how big the warehouse needs to be, do negotiation on the contracts for the warehouse, maybe send some stuff over, check the port of entry, which is best likely uh, and most convenient. Um, so there's quite a logistical stuff they can do on a tourist visa and the guys at the, at the border won't have any issue with regards to that. Uh, while you then simultaneously, as you get things straightened out with a business plan, uh, get an Alvis or something like that going. Yeah, it might. It may well be that he sets up an LLC initially, uh, if there if there are going to be some some money flowing, um, and yeah. at the same time, possibly look at uh, looking at at an L or another visa category. Yeah. Uh, we've got a message from Hendrik. Uh, he's an existing client of yours. Uh, apologies, he joined the webinar a bit late. Hello, Hendrik. Uh, he's wanting to know how Trump's immigration de decision will impact himself. Uh, I don't know which Hendrik it is. The only people that uh, this Trump administration impacts... Huh? Hendrik from Lincoln Country Feed Yard. Oh, yes. You're going to need to wait a little bit <laughs> until okay. they open things back up. <laughs> so we're obviously, in, in his case, I don't want to disclose you know, too much information about the status of your case, but there may be a little bit of a pause in your case. It's not going to be too long. 60 days. The consulates, in fact, are closed for most of that 60 yeah. days in India. Right, another one, a anonymous attendee. With the L visa, what are the milestones you need to achieve after year one to get another year, another year visa and how much time spent in and out of the country? Okay, so th those are very good questions. There is no real milestones other than the ones that you may be set out in your business plan. And... Uh, I think once we get to the renewal stage, it really becomes a, a more of a question about your position on how you've elevated yourself as an executive or manager uh, that I think is going to probably be the, the biggest focus that we will focus on, and aside from other ancillary stuff. So there's no real milestones that I would say, all right, you have to have employed 10 people because I don't know what your business plan entails and how you've met you know, some of those goals. And even if you don't, haven't met those goals, there may be some good reasons for it. So it doesn't necessarily... Uh, you know, detrimental to your L visa. The other question is how often, how long do you need to be here on L visa? You don't need to even be here. You can go back and forth all the time. It's a multiple entry visa that are, that allows you to keep running the South African business as well as this uh, American business. So there's no requirement for you to physically be here all the Perfect. time. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to have one, the last two questions here. Uh, Kanye says, so EB5 allows 10,000 visas per year. Mm -hmm. Is that 10,000 families per year or is that just 10,000 visas per year? Yeah, 10,000 applicants. So, you know, th there hasn't really been a big concern about that specifically as it relates to South Africans. And here's the reason why is it's because, you know, if you compare those 10,000 to the rest of the world, you would say, well, that's unfair. You know, if we're only, if we're a population in South Africa of 400, 400 million and you have a country like China with 1.5 billion people applying, of course, these guys are obviously going to snap up that 10,000 uh, 10, in a New York minute. But that's not how it works. They, they kind of carve this out from a percentage point of view where you will see on the visa bulletin with regards to availability on, um, you know, who gets to, uh, who, who gets to wait and who not. South Africans... <laughs> there's just not enough uh, people in South Africa to really even get on the radar with regards to a backlog on those EB-5s. So uh, I don't think it really matters too much. Okay. Uh, Grant is a question, cost of setting up of an LLC. Uh, Grant, we typically, if you're wanting to set up an LLC, we'll put you in contact with a CPA. Um, that it's really it's a couple of hundred dollars. It's, it's a pretty seamless uh, uh, process. It is important for you to note that you would need to have one of your members uh, have a social security number, uh, but I, I can I can help you with the setting up of an LLC. Adrian's Adrian has got a question. Will I be able to sponsor my kids over twenty one on the EB five? Yes, as a permanent resident, you can as long as they are unmarried. Yep. So Adrian, the important thing is that your children would need to remain unmarried. Uh, that's most probably the biggest challenge, but yes, it yep. is uh, it is possible. Um, Roland has a question. Can I start the company registration while on a B1, B2 visa? Delayed visit to the US due to Corona before starting the L1 visa. Yes, you, yeah. yes, you can, yeah, Roland. You know, you do, do, do not need to be in the US to um, set up a company. We can start that. 
Leon, I think that's it. We've got a couple of other questions, but I've sort of sifted through them just because I'm very conscious that uh, we're well over an hour. Um, so that was great, Leon. Um, I think we covered a lot uh, this evening. Appreciate it. We had a really good uh, turnout in terms of people uh, attending, which is nice. And as always, Leon, a uh, great, valuable source of information from a legal perspective. Yeah. Um, For sure. Only my pleasure. Good. Chris, uh, thank you. Do you have any closing remarks? Uh, Chris, you can obviously see we've had uh, a really nice webinar tonight. A lot of people attended. Um, seems to be a bit of a, uh, a mixture of people considering EB5 and possible Ls. No, Stuart, thanks. Nothing further from my side. Uh, well done, guys. And I uh, thought it was a good presentation. And, um, you know, we'll be uh, around for the next one. And uh, any questions that need to be um, directed to me, um, I'm sure you guys will have the detail and pass it on. Uh, but okay. thanks and well done, guys. Excellent. And then from our side, my team will be dropping out a thank you for attending webinar. Uh, those that are wanting to have one-on-ones with myself and Leon will then set up a separate Zoom calls um, and discuss in detail the various immigration options that may or may not be available to yourself. So once again, thanks very much. Stay safe during the corona uh, epidemic. Um, and certainly we look forward to assisting you in terms of your aspirations to, to get into the US. Thank you once again, Leon. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you.